Welcome, everyone, to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Christina Hamilton, the series director, and I am thrilled to be at the top of what promises to be a great season. Uh, we have a dynamic roster of guests to challenge and inspire you, details of which are listed in the new season calendar. Uh, it's available in the lobby. Pick one up on your way out. Find us online at pennystampsevents.org. You can sign up to receive our weekly emails, or you can join us on Facebook at Penny Stamps Lecture Series and plan to be here most every Thursday from now through April. Uh, today, we open our season with poet, performer, publisher, producer, Jessica Caramore. Uh, she is here with some special guests today. She has world-renowned drummer Marwan Aminra and house music pioneer DJ Stacy Hotwax Hale. Uh, yeah, some special stuff, you know? Uh, actually, uh, I should tell all of you, in lieu of our regular Q&A today, you can meet all of these characters. Uh, Jessica has some merchandise at the table where we normally have book sales out in the lobby. So if you have a question for her, if you want to meet her, if you're dying to get a piece of something that she's created, uh, go meet her directly after uh, her performance here on stage in the lobby. Uh, I want to thank our partners for their support of today's program, the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, the Institute for the Humanities, and Michigan Radio 91.7 FM. Uh, always aiming for a deeper immersive experience, I want to point out to you that Jessica's work is currently on view in Detroit at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History as part of their Say It Loud exhibition. Uh, this exhibition is commemorating the 1967 Detroit Rebellion, and you should not miss this show. And while you are downtown, there are other exhibitions also illuminating 1967, which are so nearby, you can actually walk between these institutions. Or you could always take the new Q line if you want to check out the new streetcar. Uh, there is Sonic Rebellion at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit. Uh, and actually, Jessica is going to close that show in January. So if you want to see her perform again on January 4th. Uh, and Detroit 67 Perspectives uh, at the Detroit Historical Society. Uh, and the DIA is part of the show as well. So you should definitely check this out, not to be missed. And an update on next week. Hopefully everyone has now heard that very unfortunately, uh, Congressman John Lewis uh, has work that must be done in Washington uh, on September 21st. There has been, the Congressional Black Caucus has called a meeting. So we honor him in that. Uh, we have a, a screening that we're going to host next week in lieu of his appearance. And we are working with his office on a rescheduled date. We're hoping to make that announcement next week. Uh, and next week, we're going to show a documentary, the only documentary ever made dedicated to John Lewis, which just came out this year. It's called Get in the Way. Detroit Public Television is partnering with us on this screening. And it will be here in our regular penny stamp slot next week for free, as always. Uh, being the opening event of the season, uh, I'm going to give you just a few thoughts on the season's theme and its genesis. Uh, I don't know how many of you have noticed it. Uh, looking to celebrate unity in the face of division, uh, the title sort of announced itself one day, actually while I was sweeping the floor. Uh, I happened on an Indian head penny and the words e pluribus unum arose. E pluribus unum. This is the Latin for many are one, or one from many. And most of this know this uh, as a traditional motto of the United States appearing on the Great Seal, our national emblem, on official documents such as money, passports, the seal of the president, the Congress, and the United States Supreme Court. But as for its source, it has actually been utilized uh, across the ages, uh, from Virgil to St. Augustine and beyond. And its earliest identifiable iteration was actually by Cicero uh, as a paraphrase of Pythagoras. Uh, he was classifying uh, the basic family and social bonds being the origin of society and states. And he wrote, the one is made up of all things, and all things issue from the one. A simple, profound statement. And after all, we are each as of us as individuals, one from many. As our DNA denotes all of those who came before us. And just as our society, our country, our whole world is made up of all of us, and we, right now, are making up all that will come after us. 
So the Penny Stamp Speaker Series is here as a platform for many creators, innovators, visionaries from all corners of the globe, working in all variety of media across all spectrums and specializations. And all of this work that they do is unified in this common effort towards the advancement of humanity through the betterment of our mutual understanding. So E Pluribus Unum as our theme this year is a celebration of that unity. And I hope this season brings each of us a deeper understanding of ourselves and each other, and through that, a sense of our interconnectedness and that being so interconnected is in fact a wonderful thing. And today we open the season with someone who I think embodies these ideals, a true Renaissance woman who has honed her many voices and vehicles with which to express herself. And we have someone very special here to make her introduction today. Uh, for her uh, introduction, I wanna welcome, uh, we have a woman who has led, been the premier of many museums dedicated to the African American history and story in this country. She is currently the president and CEO of the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in Detroit. Please welcome Juanita Moore. Hello. I um, have a, this really great privilege to introduce Jessica. She is, my name is Juanita Moore, but we are actually not related. Um, not by blood anyway, but we, she is my sister. All art forms possess liberty beyond space and time, yet grounded by the urgency of now and a breath of truth. That aptly describes the work that Jessica does. But few artists have traveled, have channeled Detroit spirit so powerfully and deeply as Jessica Care Moore. She is an internationally beloved poet, but her heart and work are forever embedded in Detroit. Jessica Care Moore has been on our radar for a long time. She won the legendary it's Apollo, it's Showtime at the Apollo competition for a record breaking five times in a row. She later became one of the breakout stars of the Russell, C Russell Simmons HBO series, Deaf Poetry Jam. The list of her publications are too extensive to read here. As president of the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, I've had the pleasure of working with Jessica and getting to know her very well. She has an amazing work ethic and has the highest standards of quality. Every year she presents an amazing, amazing weekend of programming at the museum called Black Women Rock. And it, black women really do rock. She brings in some of the top quality artists from all over the world. It's a great highlight and it sells out as soon as the tickets come on sale. She has a commitment to bring great women to Detroit from all over the world. She brings the best because she wants to perform with the best and she wants Detroit to have the best. As a writer and a poet, she is carrying on the tradition of legendary artists such as Amira Baraka, Gil Scott Heron, and Sonia Sanchez. But her style is unique and instantly recognizable. She has been embraced by many of the most important hip hop artists of the era, such as Talib Kweli and Nas. She is truly one of the great voices of her generation. Jessica is also deeply engaged with and personally invested in Detroit. She's that rare kind of artist who has found global acclaim while still remaining deeply rooted in her hometown and in grassroots activism. Part of the reason her poetry remains so fresh and relevant is that she is deeply engaged in the struggle to build a strong, equitable Detroit. Her dedication to her community and her mentorship of emerging poets and musicians are without parallel. She is as dedicated to her work with children returning citizens, men and women and youth in jails and prisons, as she is committed to Detroit. She cares and demonstrates it with her work in communities across this country. Jessica Caremore is a spoken word artist. She's a hip hop artist. She's a filmmaker. She's a visual artist. She's a musician, a public publisher, an activist for social justice and the rights of women. And the most extraordinary human being. But at the top of any list that you, where you're describing Jessica is that she is a phenomenal mother of a king. And I am honored to know her. And I bring to the stage here at the Penn Stamps Distinguished, Pu 
Distinguished Speaker Series, Jessica Care Moore, Mother of King. Internationally renowned, traveled all over the world, so humbled to have, um, have him with us today. Please welcome Marwan Amon Ra to the stage on percussion. <laughs> I want to quickly thank um, my sister Juanita Moore for that beautiful introduction. I'm like, she wrote something, oh my God! Uh, but um, it's important when you're an artist um, in any city to have institutions that support your work, and the Charles H. Wright has been supporting my work. When I was living in Brooklyn and Harlem, they were supporting my work. And when I came home after 12 years, they continued to support my work in bigger ways. So please um, just thank Juanita Moore one more time with a round of applause for <laughs> driving in rush hour traffic to get here, just so she could introduce me. And to Christina Hamilton, like Christina, thank you so much. Um, she was there when I did my TED talk with Marion Hayden uh, with a piece, one of the pieces I'm gonna do for you this evening. Um, and so I just would think she's done a really, really a lot of work to make this happen. And um, I appreciate every single one of you for showing up, even the ones that had to because it's part of your <laughs> grade. So if you don't know my work, art and design students, that's okay, because now you do. And now you will. Um, I'm going to start. I started with Catch Me If You Can. Um, that's a song off my album that Talib Kweli put out in 2015. So I start very, I'm starting very current, and then I'm going to go into some of how I got to this place. Because um, at one time I was just a student um, at this other Michigan school, <laughs> but I still wore blue for y'all. <laughs> this is for y'all. I, I went to state, and I went to Wayne State, and um, and um, yeah, yeah. But so once you like get grown up, you kind of just don't care as long as it's Michigan. Um, as long as it's Michigan, I'm on that side. They play in Ohio State, I'm down with U of M. So, so I, I started that, and so um, to say that I'm going to just tell you a story, because you don't just get here. You don't just get to a place where you have the CEO of the Charles H. Wright Museum coming to introduce you, right? And I'm not an old lady, so, you know, like, I've been doing this for full time for 25 years and making a living as a poet, uh, which is not easy in this country, um, because I'm not writing about easy things. So I'm going to be talking um, to you, and Stacey Hotwax is going to be playing some things for you that you may not know about, haven't heard before, and um, we're just going to have a good time. Cool? We're going to talk to each other. We got the drum here. We're going to have a conversation. Uh, I'm going to open with this piece. It's called You Want Poems. I'm excited. I'm using a clicker for my first time. This is like my clicker premiere, so there's that. Okay, and maybe it's going to, I'm going to click it, and then it's supposed to do something. I'm going to see it. Yay. Oh my gosh, shout out to Brandy Keeler, who is my fierce designer, who's not here, but she did this beautifulness for me. Yes. So I'm going to play this, but I want the sound muted. Um, so this poem is called You Want Poems, and I'm really um, honored that it is on the display at the Smithsonian Museum of African American History in Washington, D.C., which is pretty awesome. And it's a poem about being a woman. Um, it's in my book, Sunlight Through Bullet Holes, and it's about... Um, the balance of, it's hard when you are a woman that reads books to find a date sometimes. And so, <laughs> you can find a couple husbands, but yeah. So, 
This is called You Want Poems, because when you're a poet, everybody asks you for a poem. And poems, for me, are everything. It's like the car that I drive, it's the house that I built, it's the children that I've raised. I've raised them all on poems. And so when people ask me for something like that, like it's a small thing, it irritates the hell out of me. And so this is called You Want Poems. <clears throat> when you are a woman, when you are brown, when you are brave, when you walk over glass like water, when you know your eyes are borrowed like time, when you peel off your skin for the very first time. Fear is never in style in the mecca of the blue. Fear never lives in the gut of the new. You want poems, and I want to build my home. You want poems, and I just want love in my hands. You want poems, and I'm not interested in fans. You love me inside my magic, and I just want you to see you already had it. It is the telling when someone asks. It's the way he holds the glass, licks the surface, examines without touching. It's the way our energy takes over rooms. It is the subtle conversation. It is the freedom of emancipated language. It is words scribbled inside my skin. It's the curve of the lie, the beauty of the lies. Stories passed down through generations of pain and pride, ocean and tide. Water remembers, water returns. African mermaids blending with dark sand. It is the danger of the dance. The upright base of the heart, the dice or drum, the symbol tease, the last laugh, the addiction to this moment. Where else do I put it? Don't know where to put it, place it, bury it, deep in my chest, back of my throat. Where should I hide it on this stage? Should I give it to you? Here is my honesty, my work undressed, legs stretched across piano, traded like cattle, raped like animal, left for dead, sucked dry for inspiration, in love with the idea of living long enough to simply write about it, push it out my body and watch my son slowly grow into it. You said you wanted a poem. Now what you gonna do with it? Huh? Billy, Phyllis, Etta, Abby, Nina, Whitney, how much time you got? How much time you got? I'm a body of clocks. I'm a master of mics. I'm a metaphor for survival. I'm the goal they use to build their churches. A beautiful idea to flirt with, but who should I marry? The moonlight, the sunrise, the white dove, the wolf, and Easter music, this music, a prayer. How many babies are we gonna make inside a song? Which revolution, which nation shall we rule? The island of the spirit world, the beauty of the believers, the carpenters, the men who build the dream and place you on the front line of their planet. One day, the stars will line up between breath and ink and voice, between reality and choice. It is the danger of the dance, the upright bass of the heart, the dice roll drum, the cymbal tease, the last laugh, the addiction to this moment. Thank you. So, it's just a love poem. I thought I'd start off nice <laughs> so that I didn't scare you away. <laughs> And um, yeah, because the sound of like a poet and then like a black woman poet is like triple dread scary. I remember being in Macy's in New York City and I was performing in the cellar. You know, like a whole group of, uh, I don't know, other people that were like terrified of me. And they were women. They complained about the sound of, sound of my voice. Like I never forgot that. Like they were complaining and they were women complaining about my voice, my voice scared them. It was because I sounded free when I talked. <laughs> so when I opened my mouth and got on the microphone at Macy's, like on 34th Street in New York City, they were offended by my voice, just the sound of it. And so um, this is called There Was a Fire in Her Belly, and I'm asking my brother Marwan to join me. Um, uh, Juanita Moore mentioned the rebellion. Y'all are, I wasn't even born during the dang on rebellion. So um, were any of you, anybody here rebellion babies? Couple, couple of y'all older than me, that's great. <laughs> it's always good to have somebody older than me here. Um, so this is called There Was a Fire in Her Belly, and it's really about, I, I call myself a post-riot baby, right? Because like my poems come from a lot of places, and my, my father was, like, Tom Moore was like a working class, um, I'm gonna put my, do my clicker so his picture is above. He's like a work, uh, he worked for himself, uh, Tom's trucking his whole life. So I, nev I never saw my black father from Alabama ever work for anybody, especially not anybody white and my mother um that's my daddy look he can't work for no white man look at his suit they don't know what to do with all that in that cadillac he had to he had to find his own way and <laughs> and because of that girl that girl on the left you know that's who i became the same person and um he died in 1994 and he gave me all of this work to do 
And my father is completely a part of my journey. Um, when Juanita Moore talks about the Apollo Theater, I, had le I left Detroit in 1995, a year after my father passed, following the last poets to New York City and stayed. And five months later, I was famous all over the world, really, because at that time, Showtime at the Apollo was being played in all over London and Paris. And so I started getting first, my first international gigs at 22. It was bananas. And I won doing poetry. But I cried every single night on that stage because my father wasn't there. He was, you know, he was everything to me. My father was God to me. That's what God looked like, a black man in a suit with a Cadillac was like, that was my vision of God. And so, um, and so I moved to New York City, and my, yeah, he really was, I began to write. I was already writing poetry when I was in ninth or 10th grade, and I found Intazaki Shange. Shout out to, like, my Susan Story, my drama coach at Cody High School. You know, it's a shame what they've done to our schools because drama and art completely saves children's lives, and she saved my life. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be standing at University of Michigan, at the Michigan Theater, if my drama teacher didn't bring Intazaki Shange and To Kill a Mockingbird and Grease, for that matter. Just, she completely introduced us to the world of theater, and those things don't exist for our babies anymore, but I wouldn't be here without it. But this is called There Was a Fire in Her Belly, and that when the fire is me in my mama's belly, and, um, whose name is Irene. 1971, Tom and Irene answered back, made their first post-riot daughter, bottle-fed naivety and rainbows that included black and pride. 1971, she questioned everything. There was a fire in her belly. Uh-huh, there was a fire. But can't nobody afford no fires in Detroit? She better give that baby back. There was a fire in her belly. Uh-huh, there was a fire. But can't nobody afford no fires in Detroit? She better give that baby back back. I can hear the gunshots mixed with Isaac Hayes, my brothers pretending to know karate, blue brown belts chopping the wind. I knew I was different early. I used to like to break glass and examine the mirror for hours at a time. I knew I was somebody's secret. I didn't start all them fires. I'm just a little girl. I'm just a little brown girl. I'm just pigtails and poems and waiting. The words just came out that way, twisted, transformed into something new, something I could eat and not choke on. This was my story and I was gonna tell it. This was my story and I was gonna tell her whether they wanted me to tell it or not. I was nine years old when I attempted to write my first novel. I don't know if I'd read nine novels, but I was nine and I wanted to write one. Still writing it. Still writing it. They say there are ghosts in the house I was born in, running up and down the stairs. Maybe they're looking for the family that used to fill it up, checking for the pencil markings on the wall to score how tall we grown, or the bird that died, and the dogs that ran off sometimes. Maybe they're just looking for the kids. Four to a minimum in a house used to make this block so noisy. Maybe they're trying to find at least one, two family household in this city. They could just be bored, might be laid off, stressed out. Sometimes ghosts take to running. I know I did for 12 years. I was gone like the wind ghosts, but the wind just moves in circles. Smoke signals, they say, picking up dust in a husband or two. At least I'm trying, at least I'm writing. Somebody got to tell them we are in this city and we are not ghosts. Thank you. We are not ghosts, right? We Are Not Ghosts became like this, thank you, a really major documentary film. Some, a couple from Seattle came in town and they heard my work and they named their documentary We Are Not Ghosts after my poem. Later we got the credit, but they did do that. Um, that was hilarious. And so, I don't know, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep this, I'm gonna move this. I'm so excited about my clicker. It's like my, <laughs> I'm gonna do all my damn readings with clickers now and stuff, cool stuff behind me. Um, this is a poem from, so I've written four books. Um, my fifth one is called We Want Our Bodies Back, which is the name of this event. And, um, and it's uh, for Sandra Bland. And I wanna, I, I forgot to mention at the top of the show because there's so much I wanna say to you. Um, Cause you're, it's such an important time in your life and it's important that people like me are in front of you. You know, that you're not reading about old dead white men only, right? Um, because they're not the only ones who exist. <laughs> Like, I'm a human being with blood running through my bodies. I'm like 30 minutes away. You can hit me up on email, Instagram, Facebook. You know, it's important that you know that there's contemporary poets and writers who are creating work that is relevant to your life um, right now. And, um, and so, yeah, Princess is a poem I wrote in um, one of my books. I can't even remember which one it's in. Maybe it's in the alphabet versus the ghetto. And um, it's called Princess. And I was living in Harlem at the time. And the woman was actually in the Bronx. But I put her in Harlem. And she 
jumped off her project roof. So New York One was doing this story on this woman who jumped off her project roof, committed suicide, and took her children with her. And the way that they were telling the story, it's, hard, it's ridiculous to think about it, um, but the way the reporter was telling the story, and because I had a journalism background, I, when I went to college, I thought I was gonna be like this CNN reporter or whatever, and, um, but I didn't want to straighten my hair, so. Back then it wasn't cool to have natural hair. You know, now that women wear afros and things, back then it was like you had to straighten your hair like a white girl and put the curls in it. And so um, I was like, why well, I gotta do that? But whatever, that's another story. Um, so I just gave up on journalism when poems started making me more money. And, and I could just do it with integrity and I have to ask for permission to what to say. Um, but Princess was about, you know, I didn't like the way the reporter was telling the story. And I was like, well, she, I feel like she had no empathy. She probably had never walked in that neighborhood in the Bronx. Um, and I wanted to retell her story. So this is a retelling of her story. I don't know her name. I don't, this isn't really her story. It's my envisioning of her story. Um, and it's called Princess. Cement and blood and Dairy Queen ice cream licks melt like butter and fold into my batter. I am whipped into resistance with switches and cords. I can't recognize love, can't spell Lord. They name me Princess. I live in the projects. My castle has 25 floors, 400 families. One day I will be the queen. On Monday, I'll get to wear my favorite jeans. On Tuesday, I'll start a revolution. No one will notice, but it will be happening. Bombs, firecrackers, exploding glass, water balloons dropping from my roof. Thousands of little girls like me jump down my chin, clown down my arms, reach for breathable air, then let go. Suddenly, without any warning, in the middle of an average weekday, I will fly to my early death, hanging from brown fingertips, still sweaty from my birth. Mama, no, we would scream, watching as the others escaped, ran to freedom, went to college, gave birth to families, I will become a child martyr, a product of welfare cycles and poison grape flavored water around thin foil tops. I grab my sister's small hands and we fly like mystery angels, 25 floors before hitting the ground and we are beautiful night owls and mama won't have to watch us starve no more. We have won the war on drugs, become destiny's daughters, dance with clouds, drink from the retrograde of mercury, we gonna be black stars, mama, we gonna be on TV. An appalling scene here in Harlem, a black woman apparently jumps to her death with her three small children in her arms, news at 11. I remember how surprised they seemed, guess it cut them off guard, us deciding our own fate. They didn't get a chance to finish their crack baby experiment. Their faces are red, they're angry, because they didn't get to push us or pick which tree this time. How could a mother of three kill her own children? How could a mother of three kill her own children when she could have left them with a system that doesn't provide adequate health care or equal access to education? Why do you think they love Oprah but hate it, beloved? Black folks ain't allowed to be magic. They took, they look taking back my, they look taking back my, cause you took us back from them. Your womb became an underground railroad. We died like royalty, wearing wings shaped by old wire coat hangers. You name me princess, I live in America. My castle has 25 floors, 400 families, and one day I will be the queen. We need new moves. Queens created out of red clay dust, pushed into classroom terrorism, girlhood rush. Our black boys born kings. You try to crucify them, they built with steel and dreams. Who's the criminal when the global blood is on your hands? We indigenous, these streets been our land. You're not supposed to see death this early in the morning. If God is an American, then God must be lonely. Who knows what this album from? I'll give you a free in book. In Afghanistan, the underestimated, I'll live in our circumstance. <laughs> Some it. of us don't dance. Some of us got plans. We don't smile for you, but our laugh is hard. Our new religion includes tearing down privatized, privatized, prison bars, prison bars, prison bars, prison bars. Who wants a free book? Whose album is this on? Let's go, millennials. Whose album is this on? Wow, isn't that good? Young, young Jeezy, Church in These Streets. Yeah, ooh, yup. I didn't know who, I had to Google them. There's that. Um, <laughs> I did. I was like, who wants me to be on this album? And it's important that I say that because we talk a lot about, you know, I'm, a, I'm from the hip hop generation. You know, I came up on like Ron DMC and Dougie Fresh and Karis One and Rakim and all these people, right? And as a poet, you know, as Talib Kweli, who's, y'all know who Talib Kweli is? Y'all under some, okay, all right. We're not on, we on, we above the rocks in Ann Arbor, Talib. Talib does mass shows in Ann Arbor, right? And so, um, I think maybe even here. Um, Talib is one of my best friends. Like 20 years ago, I met him and Most Deaf, and 
um, Common and all these people, and we've, our careers became what they became. And I was a poet in the middle of that, right, in, in, in 1995 when hip hop and raucous records was beginning. And so it's funny because people say, oh, you know Mosef, or oh, you know Talib, or oh, you know Common. I'm like, they know me. They know me, goddammit. Like, it ain't because I know them. Because fame is a lie. And all of them just trying to take care of families at this point. We're all showing each other just people's kids and backstage at shows. But really, it's um, Talib was on WDT once. Um, he was coming in for a concert at the Majestic, I think, or whatever. And he said, um, someone said, oh, you know, it's talking about my work. And Talib was like, well, Jessica's my peer. And because, you know, this is such a, um, I see a Detroit Thick shirt in the audience. I cannot. Is that Amanda? Hey, Amanda. It's my friend, Amanda. She's Freggers. Hi. It was my Detroit Thick. Give it up for Amanda. She's having a baby. And she's Detroit Thick. Yes, baby. She's part of my Black Women Rock production staff. I love you. Yes. Filipino Women Rock. Um, and so, I forgot what I was talking about. You threw me completely off. <laughs> Get on my nerves. <laughs> So the point is, um, I've done a lot of work with a lot of people. So Nas, um, I did his album in 1999. I opened and closed Nostradamus. So are you hip hop lyricists, people who study MCs and poetry? That's relevant. Um, it's not relevant now, but as, you, as history goes on, it will be interesting when they find out who this poet is on these rappers' albums and why me and why they ask, you know? Um, it's because I'm a part of a community that I, in New York City especially, that MCs and poets and visual artists and break dancers and everybody who did everything smart were friends. <laughs> and so we all knew each other. But it doesn't make someone more relevant because they're more famous. It doesn't make your work less relevant if you're an art student or design student because if you design the big thing downtown or you design something that changed a village's life, right, in some other country or whatever. Um, so I never based my fame on how big I would blow up or how famous I got. I've, I've done enough at this point in my career, but I'm good, you know, and like everyone will have to just catch the fuck up. Um, I've done a lot of work and I do believe in helping other artists, but other artists, and I wanna mention men because I'm on Kareem Riggins, New City, Head Not Sweet. So if you're a head that listens to music, you know who Kareem is, one of the baddest drummers in the country is from Detroit. He plays with Common, play with Erica, play with everybody. And also um, Nas and Weldon Irvine is important for me because of this poem that we're about to do. Weldon Irvine, anybody? Come on jazz, any jazz heads here who know who Weldon is? I'm here to teach. I'm available for residency work at the University of Michigan. Y'all need some help. It's okay. I'm going to help y'all. So that's all right. That's what I'm here for. It's all good. I'm an educator. So Weldon Irvine um, co-wrote To Be Young, Gifted, and Black. You know the song? Aretha Franklin and Nina Simone sang it pretty. It was a, it was a theme song for the civil rights movement. He was the co-writer of that. And he was a dear, dear friend of mine and a mentor to Q-Tip and to me and to Most Def and many um, other MCs, um, just a badass musician. And he did an album called Spoken Melodies a long time ago, Weldon and the Poets, because he was on the poetry scene, like literally as a grown man and, um, with us in Brooklyn. And when I wrote this poem, uh, DHS office poem number seven. It's about me returning to Detroit. I was gone for 12 years in New York and Atlanta. I had big houses. I traveled the world. And then my, mar my, uh, my second marriage just fell to hell, fell apart. And I had a 10-month-old baby named King that Juanita mentioned. And I had to come home. I had to come home. Um, and it's important to be able to come home. What a blessing that I have family I can come home to. I had to come home and figure out how I was going to make a living in Detroit as a poet, which is a joke, because nobody does that here. Um, so I refused to let that be my story. So whatever you want to do, students, whatever art and design, whatever you're studying here at University of Michigan, like don't let anybody tell you what the fuck you can't do. I'm gonna stop saying the F-bomb, but just don't let anybody stop you from telling you what the fuck you can do. Because <laughs> you can do whatever the fuck you feel like doing. And you can imagine yourself, like I imagine my life. It's unimaginable for most people. Like, like, I came home and I didn't have no job. I was, I was gone 12 years and I went and got a loft, a, a spot at the lofts in Merchant Road downtown. That is ridiculous how much it costs right now. But even 10 years ago, it was high. And for a person who didn't have a job, my brothers were like, well, go get a job. I'm like, doing what? I'm a poet. What do poets do here? Starve? Okay, thank you. They don't do poetry, um, not for a living or they teach 
which is like, I'm straight. Like, I want to come to a residency, but then I want to leave. <laughs> when the residency's over, I'm straight. I'm not old enough anyway. Like, when I'm like, I got gray locks, I'll come and be on campus with you guys. But, but really, 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 like, I didn't, know, I didn't know anything else. And all I knew is that my daddy was going to guide me, the ancestors helped me, and I knew somebody was going to remember that I wrote poems that mattered. And I was um, on my ass, literally, with not a lot of money, and I went and got this loft um, downtown. And when I got the loft, I got a call for a, um, Susan Taylor from Essence Magazine called me to do something for Hurricane Katrina. Mind you, things like Hurricane Katrina mean no money. So I, had to, I still found a way to get a ticket, take my son, go down to Hurricane Katrina with Hill Harper and Yalia Van Zandt and Michael Eric Dyson, all these luminaries. And I don't have really a dime, but I still went because I sat there in that rain and I wrote a poem for Hurricane Katrina. And, and I, because the thing is what you do as an artist karmically, that thing comes back to you. And while I was there, I got another gig in West Virginia. While I was in West Virginia, I got another gig in Kentucky. And then I had 10 grand and then I was straight in my loft having my nervous breakdown in style for six freaking months. And that was fine for me, right? That's not everybody's existence. Some people are safe, right? But if you're an artist and you're safe, you suck and you're boring. And so don't do the safe thing. Do the thing that scares you the most. Do the thing that you're worried you might not be able to have any money in 30 days, but you cannot help yourself. You have to dedicate this time to this thing you have to create, right? And so I refuse to live. My brother, who I love dearly, said, well, don't you think you're living, because uh, people say this to artists all the time, uh, above your, um, what is it called? Yes, I hate that. I was like, um, well, everyone here lives below their potential. So I'm going to go where I know I have to work to make sure I can find $1,500 a month because my son has to be fresh to death at all times. And he, he has to live in a loft. And I didn't do that, mind you, forever, but I did it for that six months because I had a Honda Accord and I was coming from Atlanta and I didn't want to touch the snow and they had valet parking and it was fresh. Anyway, and so... But I believed in myself long before anybody else did. And so when I go to cities, Atlanta, New York, wherever, I see stages and I say, that one is mine. Somewhere in my subconscious, I must have claimed the Michigan fucking theater because here I am up in here. I'm F-bombing left and right, I'ma stop. That's my last F-bomb of the night. Um, but this is called, I promise try. No, <laughs> a little bit. This is called DHS office trip number seven. And it's about the welfare office because I came home, with, I was nursing my baby. I didn't know anything about welfare. My mother and father were working class parents. We weren't on welfare. I was familiar with the cheese, but that's it. And, I never had to go there, right? So this poem was the most important poems that I ever written in my entire life because now I know what it feels like to be humiliated. Now what I know what it feels like when you talk about women and other people want to put down women on welfare, are you kidding me? These are women who are simply trying to feed their children. And I got to this point, because I've heard people talk down about people on welfare. Nobody wants to be on welfare. It is no money. It is, you, are, you have to be living under a rock. You have to be so poor to get a dollar from this government. And so when you see women, and don't judge women because the men are not there and they're trying to just basically take care of children by themselves. And it's just for food. I mean, the five dollars they give you doesn't go to shoes. They're not buying Gucci bags or welfare money. It's anyway, let me shut up. So, but this is the thing that you have to deal with. But I had to take my little bougie self up in the DHS office so I could learn this. And I have to tell you this, I was in the line and there was a student in front of me from University of Michigan and it was classic. He turns around, I got my little baseball cap because I'm trying to look ugly because you can't look cute because they won't give you any money because the women are haters. So I'm like, I'm putting, no, not, the, not all women, but caseworkers at welfare offices, they hate themselves. Um, and so I got on my baseball cap and the guys in front of me turns around, he's like, aren't you Jessica Caramore? And I'm like, yeah, why? Are you talking to me at the welfare office lab right now? <laughs> like, what? And he said, I'm studying your work at the University of Michigan right now. University U of M Dearborn. He said, my, my professor has us reading your work. I said, well, put this shit in context. You know, and tell them I'm, I'm available to come visit the class for a fee. <laughs> like, I need some money. And so there's that. So this is about the welfare office, and it was a beautiful experience, and I'm going to take you on this journey. The homeless man gives my son a dollar. 
I am hiding, hoping to not look like I'm doing well. Doing well doesn't go with the chairs in this office. I'm thankful and embarrassed. The same day I was booked for a show in Paris, asked to be in a film being shot in Harlem in the summer, and booked for a keynote at another college. My son's health insurance was canceled by the state. And the daycare said I owe them $3,000 and I have to pay her so my son can register for the new year. The daycare lady is asking me if I have a job again. I am a famous, recognized poet and writer. I performed all over Europe, South America, this country. I am an Apollo legend, remember me? I was on the cover of the Metro Times last month, the cover of African American Family when my son began here in the summer. His pictures are on the inside. My photos are in full color and six feet tall at the Museum of African American History. I am one of the women of a new tribe. I'm on exhibit, on display, always on display. Exactly what does being a legend pay? I need some W-2s for this life. This is madness, I tell myself. In order, to, in order to receive help from the state, you have to be working. My writing is my work. I can't have my son 24 hours a day and write and create new work. Question marks float on top of the head of the caseworker. Harvey Hancock plays in the background. This is the music I brought to this place. This is the music I brought to this place. Never leave your music at home. Never leave your music at home. They only play the TV on one station in the lobby, the sci-fi channel or something. Sometimes there are cookies full of m and King. Don't touch the cookies, baby King. Don't touch the cookies. I made up a job because my job is not a job. I made up a job because my job is not a job. And I apparently told them I make too much money that doesn't really exist, so now I'll be allocated $12 a month for food. My first husband calls me by mistake in the middle of all of this. My husband calls me my mistake in the middle of all of this. We laugh about reading poems for 20 years. Our son, my earth son, cracks jokes about him getting old. We are elders and we still young, says Kevin Powell. This is a thankless job. Weldon Irvine, remember I told you about Weldon Irvine? This is a thankless job. Weldon Irvine will whisper in my ear at the Schomburg before he killed himself a few years later. Thankless, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you, thankless, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. Joni Mitchell to drown out this moment. Mariah Carey, Anita Baker, Jennifer Hudson, and yeah, even that new Beyonce song, If I Were a Boy. Thank you, angels, past lovers, ex-husbands, rappers, DJs, producers, basketball players, guitar, guitar players, novelists, philosophers, painters, bullshitters, haters, liars, oh, the liars, bless you. Industry intellectuals that will never, ever get it. All you deep mofos, thank you, most deaf, Yasin Bey for telling me it was honorable to live my life, travel the world. And when people ask me what I do, I simply say, I'm a poet. Thank you, Talib Kweli, for being a friend outside the music. Thank you, Roger Guinevere Smith, for Huey P. Newton and the head nod. To Ozzy Davis for that elbow on my arm and that smile. Thank you, Nas, for the prediction, because we never know the outcome. Thank you, Last Poets, and Sonia, and Baba Haki, and Mary Baraka. Thank you, my Nana, for buying coats, and uncles for shoes, and daycare. More family. I have more family. I was born and more. I'm headed to LA for some shows. I have to stop crying and write this show. But this is not a show. This is my life. This is my life, God. My blessing, my gift. Got a gig in Cincinnati while I was writing this. My January rent, thank you. Daddy, God, past lovers, present lover. Got your text, baby, I'm okay. Thankless, thankless, Thanksgiving. No, thank you, said the abused turkeys. No, thank you for your slaughter. In the name of giving, in the name of family, homes. This is what I had to give. I'm eating poems today. I'm thankful, I'm humiliated, I'm embarrassed, I'm surviving. I'm thankful, I'm humiliated, I'm embarrassed, I'm surviving, I'm surviving. Odetta just died, Lucille Clifton just died, Jane Cortez just died, Gil Scott Heron just died, Dick Gregory just died. You can't stop me, no, you can't stop me, no. This this is my job, damn it. This is my job, you know. I'm a mother, give me my check. I'm a mother, give me my check. Amen, 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 amen. A woman, a poet. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm hiding all the turkeys in the backyard next year. Now how all of y'all gonna give thanks? Somebody gotta die for you to be thankful? I miss you, Yale, Richard Pryor, Tom Moore, Marion McKeeba, Seku Sindiata, Weldon Irvine, Joseph, Rosa Parks. You can't find them. You can't find me. You can't find them. You can't find me. We are busy writing. We're busy confusing your paperwork with real life. The, in the my internet with the real life. My lover says he talks to me in real life. The internet is an illusion, but people are addicted to illusions though. Thankless, thankless world. I mean, 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 I mean. Thank you.
We're good? I'm, gonna, I'm talking a lot. I'm sorry. But I have to talk to you because I have to. <laughs> um, so this is a piece I wrote um, after Trayvon Martin was killed. And uh, being an artist um, and not an activist doesn't make sense for me. It's just not in my body um, to not have empathy <laughs> when human life is taken this way. Um, and that's for children all over the globe. Um, but it's right in your backyard, and I'm a mother of sons. I have an earth son, Omari Jazz. Um, he's 22, and, and my son, King Moore, um, who's very special to me. And so when boys, and in general, but if, when black boys are killed, um, you, when you are a mother of black boys, it's difficult to not be very devastated by it and in and, and fear for their lives. Um, so this is a poem that I wrote called There Has to Be a Safe Place for Boys. And I wrote it for Trayvon Martin and, and for his mother. There has to be a safe place for boys. Brown boys who lace their will and dreams inside designer shoes. Untraceable boys we lose with no media attention to the prison industrial complex. We complex, beautiful boys. Rocking headphones to block out the reality. Sometimes it takes a head nod so you can truly see the God in me. I know they walk at night like stars because they created this astrology. So when one of ours is taken, we want justice, not apologies. I want to walk in a store or from a store where no one's trying to follow me. You follow me? We birth our babies unarmed, a war being raged against their existence at conception, brilliant young kings in the making, searching for footing on rich soil, wet cement, pulling them back into this America's schizophrenic quicksand, this land with their veins deeply rooted inside southern trees with stories passed down through hands covered in white cotton and sugar red dye skittles in their pockets. We die too easily for a whistle or a glance, driving while black, breathing. How do we protect them from the decay of history, institutionalized racism, Segregated, privatized classrooms. Mama Diallo's blood in these oceans. Mama Baraka's daughter's heart in their teeth. Five children in San Diego lost their mom because of her choice to wear a hijab. We swallow violence whole after pushing our potential beauty into this world. At least we can offer our children is safety. The least we can offer our children is safety. We are simply mothers running with our sons away from bullets, from the poverty of miseducation. Our twilight children, black gold survivors, we melt down and mold into men. We the forgotten Holocaust, the genocidal genuflecting cross we bear on your knees, behind your back. Our neighborhood watch created the heavens. Who are you to play God? I watch black boys, free spirits at five, turn to dust by 13 in these streets. It is difficult to walk upright when you know a wrong move can kill you. Hands in your pocket is a death sentence. Running can get you killed. Dancing is illegal. And simply standing on a corner with your friends is lethal. They suck the cool out of black boys to sell their cars and shoes, then criminalize them for looking like their own ad campaign. A brother in a hoodie or saggy jeans has never treated me any worse than a suit and tie noose. Trayvon Martin is all of our sons. Hoodie up, and this means my white family too. Because if you don't make black boys your children too, then something is wrong with you. They are your children too. The weight of this does not belong to me and black women. As much as we carry it, it is also your job to protect our children in this country. It is your job to protect our children too. Because I would protect yours if a bullet was coming to any child, black, white, I don't care where they're from, children? You don't, if you don't fight for children not dying in these streets, this country is going all the way to hell. And we're already on our way with this president that we're dealing with, right? So it's up to us to show our children, all of them, that there are other people on the planet to balance the madness out. Trayvon Martin is all of our sons. Hoodie up and jeans low. Oh, goon spirit, sometimes misdirected angry when one has this country and reported the gun in the right direction. The war against our sons and daughters is unspoken, yet always present. The tanks are invisible here. Sometimes violence is in the water. It becomes a part of our lives, what we drink. We 
the children of movements. We were not meant to be still. We extensions of the earth. We the future fathers of time. We the ones they couldn't kill. We the chosen, the excellent athlete, the power suit, the fear, the pilot, the educators, our boys targeted while attempting to outlive their circumstances, to walk in a place that detached legs from trees that bore strange fruit and gave birth to blues. Are we to push them? back up into our wombs to save them from a life of inhumanity? Where is the Sonia Sanchez haiku vision of peace? We raise our daughters and pray our sons just make it home from school. Sanford, Ramallah, Joy Road, Brooklyn, Detroit, Chicago. I see Trayvon in my son's face every morning. Sabrina Fulton is still mourning. There has to be a city, a planet, a neighborhood, a black, a village, a farm, a solar system, a safe place for boys, a safe place for girls. Born with Masai, lean legs, deep brown eyes, Cherokee cheekbones, the son, our president, my president, never had another displaced flag in his 17-year-old body by a stranger claiming a discovery, a victory over something you can never discover or win when your peace is loaded in your peace. The beautiful, intangible geography of a black boy's life is difficult to navigate in the narrow, slanted view of American racism. Trayvon Martin refusing to run in the aftershock of a post-racial lie. We will stand our ground. We will shake the earth like Shango. Awaken mothers who haven't slept since the 1400s in this country anyway. We will align ourselves with humanity. You can't keep killing us randomly in the name of Malcolm, Martin, Emmett, Betty, Coretta, Harriet, Murley, mothers. Trayvon Martin will pilot the change. Trayvon soaring beyond his 17-year-old years. Trayvon is the defiant wind passing through. We must relocate our leaders inside five-year-old warriors, high pins and truth inside pigtails, so the struggle is always made new. Thank you. Thank you, my wine. I'm Mara. I know the world looking at me, the ocean so shy, the sun got my skin brown. Y'all good? Could easily be Michelle, okay. no doubt, so foul. That's why I started with a love poem. Silent, part -time loud. No Mattel, They're all no love poems. Legs like mine to play with. Some of them just have I'm a little more something going magic. on. Put the hood in my cloud, you can't have it. No curfews for goddess bandits. This is the world I've been handed. Motherships and cutlass supremes landed. Not a fan of bandwidth. I communicate with ancient Sanskrit. So since we're on the Use subject. the lead to write the life I was dealt with. Always number two to you. But I know I'm the curl. I know I'm the curl. I know I'm the curl. Y'all give it up, Stacey Howbeck, Theo. Who really should be doing the house music after party for us so we could dance, but they didn't pay for that. So <laughs> that's not happening, but I'm really happy to have her here. She spins for Black Woman Rock. She's a house music DJ I brought into a rock and roll concert series. And if you haven't been to Black Woman Rock, we're annual at the Charles H. Wright, and it's the best concert of your life. Um, come and get your life all the way at <laughs> Black Woman Rock. It's, I, I bring goddess women from around the world to play rock and roll music. Um, and yeah, there's that. And so be, vo be a void filler. You know, if I could tell students anything, it's like find a void and fill it. And um, it's what I tell my son. It's, um, it's which the gift that art and design and the things that you can, people who are creatives can do is that we can fill voids. Um, and yeah, this is, um, I can't breathe. And I wrote this for Eric Garner, and it's about my experience going to Ferguson. And mind you, I have, I did, Ferguson, I don't know, maybe King was, I don't know when Ferguson happened. Every, so many things have happened since Ferguson, you can't keep up with how many deaths and how many names, right? And um, this I wrote for Eric Garner, and because I had a connection, I worked in the St. Louis jails for seven years, um, teaching whatever, what I'm teaching right now, poetry, I guess, right? Getting them to write their stories, um, introducing them to conscious hip hop, showing them that somebody loved them, um, that I wasn't a family member. And um, I've been inside maximum security prisons. I'm inside of the hellhole Carl Rikers. I've been in Redwood, California with men who've done atrocious things, lifers who will never see the light of day. Um, been in front of like 75, 100 of those guys and them trying to figure out why I'm in front of them. And because, you know, because people are humans and that we have to take care of humans at every place. Like just because people are in jail, um, you, you can't just make them out, you know, you can't just, you can't just destroy them, you know, they're already destroyed. These are men who are never getting out of jail. And so I come in there with my little baseball cap on, and I'm like, I want to, I want to see if you can write some poems, you know, I want to see what's inside of you. Um, and because a lot of the guys that are getting out, or the, or the kids in the juvenile detention center for that matter, if they come across people like me, you don't have, you can't, I can't even count 
the amount of emails that I've gotten from the babies in the juvenile detention center because I got in front of them, how their lives have been changed. And I, you, like, art can actually do that work, you know, like love can do it, but art can really transform people's lives in that way. Just, I'm just a, the poetry teacher, you know, um, but it, it makes a difference. And so if artists are not going into jails and prisons or in schools, then they ain't shit and don't buy their records and don't support their books because we shouldn't support artists that don't care about people. Um, I, don't, I asked my students at Western International, I'm doing a residency there, I'm a dream director. And I said, well, who's one of your favorite artists? And I think one of them said Drake. I said, Drake. I said, why? Because he's cute? And she just looked at me. I said, well, it's okay if you like him because he's cute, but what has he done for your community? And silence. So, I mean, my whole thing is like, you know, you can love a mainstream artist that does nothing for your community, but if you're doing that, you're not helping artists like people like me who actually care about you and care about the community, and I'm creating culture to build culture, to, yeah, to like balance out the energy that is on the planet that's not right, that's, you know, fighting against something called DACA, like, you know, that's like trying to get rid of children who are born in this country, like that energy, if you don't have people like me on the ground, this is the kind of artist you need to support, is what I'm saying. And those knuckleheads just want your money. I don't care about your money. I don't even need it. You know, you should buy my books. <laughs> but if you don't, somebody else will. You know, um, I'm blessed. You know, I'm good. And, but you support independent artists and people who care about the community. And I'm, this is for Eric Garner and his family. And it's about me in Ferguson with my friend Talib Kweli and my sister Rosa Clemente. I'm in Detroit and I can't breathe. The air is being sucked out of the city, the poor don't have water, and everything new Detroit means no niggas. I can't breathe. There is a smoking gun down my throat with promises of a post-racial America. I can't swallow the chamber. It is stuck in 1967, and it keeps reloading after it pierces the bodies of our unarmed babies. I can't breathe, because I'm being rushed on a sidewalk in the middle of a peaceful protest by a militarized police force in Missouri. They are yelling, I got one, I got one. I am half running, distraught, searching for Talib's hand. Rosa is a few steps ahead. The air is thick and ugly and dense, and I can't breathe because now I'm being forced to lay face down on the cement in Ferguson with the AR-15 pointed at my back. A long brown teenage boy is shaking in Rosa's laps. A young thick girl stands up anyway. I pull her back down and say, please wait. In Atlanta, a beautiful young activist tells me she is arrested at 6 p.m. and is driven around by officers till 2 a.m. before they finally book her with no explanation. We know who you are, they say, hoping to replace her breath with fear. And now she doesn't know how to tell her story of being kidnapped. She can't breathe. Who can push out fresh air in this country anymore? The rich, the corporations? We should all be choking to death from Fox News and processed foods, white supremacy, and what the hell is going on at that point with Don Lemon. He needs to hit the weed, only he could smell, obviously, through that digital screen. My 19-year-old son calls me after hearing I'm in Ferguson to say, can you please go home? And he hasn't lived with me in years, so I'm trying to figure out this geographic location of this place, home, the place we should feel the safest. And I'm wondering where all this rage has been, and I'm confused because when you acknowledge race, you're called a racist. Mississippi, goddamn Missouri, feel hot as you. On Canfield, this young man smiles his gold at me. Beautiful and bright and bravado. You from Detroit, you a poet. I saw you on the news. This is the place where Mike Brown's blood turned to roses. The stem legs of our boys long and racing and always swimming toward the sun. Easily tripped up, life interrupted. The ones who don't love you are arms. As much as we claim this is our land, the world minority is running this country. Our sweat, our women, our mothers, we birthed this nation, built, built, built this nation, built it on free labor and death with no reparations ray in sight. Insight, I need more insight on what this has to do with genocide, everything. We are here with our choice. Many of us, fatherless, some of us warm-blooded, West African, Dakota, Cree, Cherokee. We are a place with no place. We are natives, beautiful somewhere people, news flag poles and crosses and so many more little girls, plus those four we will never forget. We are Moors. We're portrayed as whores, beggars. We the children of royalty. We red clay goddesses. We down south forests. We the trees that ring the stories. I can't breathe. I'm home from a terrifying place. And Octavia Butler, past future, past lives, scars we surface. I can't breathe because my son was four years and 12 and the park is his planet 
where he plays freely, and he knows a seed leaves the flowers if you plant it. He loves Bar Marley, Faith Ringgold, and Frida Kahlo. Walks with his head up and doesn't follow. Recites Baraka and sings the blues. He thinks wearing a belt is cool. He is simply a black boy with an imagination built on nations of poems and a mom that says, don't fuck with me. Cable is a, a weather, Cable is a winter luxury. So we don't get our information from the idiot box. Still, I've already had to teach my son how to act when we're pulled over by cops. He's seen them wave and like my poems. He's seen them black and flirt and ask to call me on the phone. He's seen them white in Dearborn Heights, accusing me of running a light I did not run. Mommy, but the policeman is lying. Yeah, that is the reality too, son. When I can't breathe, I cry in a parking lot, dropping you off at hockey camp, praying the white coaches and white rich children don't try to suck the beauty out of your lungs. Pray you black ice skate fast past the choke holes. The dangerous walks from the store to buy candy. I can't breathe, so I rush to get you from school daily. A collective mother's intuition always feels death moving around this winter in America clock. In these spaces where the air is thin, humanity is forgotten, an ancestral spirit is blowing hard, and fear has pushed you into a place you don't recognize. A Forced language is pushed into your mouth, whipped across your back, along the Ivory Coast, on the ship called Jesus, in the Congo, through the door of no return, in the Alabama cotton field, in Chicago, in Cleveland, in Staten Island. When you look the world in its face, after attempts to hijack your spirit, take your breath loosely, for a Lucy, I will inhale God and blow my last wind into your body. Your exhale be the Holy Ghost for this land. I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. I can't breathe, 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 I can't breathe. Deep breath, deep breath, deep breath. 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 Deep breath, deep breath. I've been needing breaks for myself. Deep breath, deep breath, deep breath. Don't go anywhere, my one. Anybody from Detroit? Yeah, is Detroit here? They let y'all in Ann Arbor? We jaywalked earlier just to see. Okay. <laughs> We're like, let's jaywalk, see if we get them in trouble. Anyway, um, I'm doing this, this piece is for Christina um, because she saw me at TED. And it's not a poem I would have normally done, but I'm doing it also for my students in Detroit public schools who, um, who struggle with just a ride to school. And a lot of them can't. Go, like, you have no idea how privileged you are, first of all, to be college students. It's very privileged. I was very privileged and didn't know how privileged I was to be a college student, but it's a privileged existence. Um, some students are absolutely being set up for workforce. Like, that is all. They're not set up to go get PhDs, become engineers, like, dream your biggest dream. That, that's not it. Like, they are being set up to fail. And even some of the students that are in the schools that are honor students, I know, because I went to state, they're gonna end up in them freshman classes with 300 other students, natural science 101, and they're gonna be lost. And it's, you're being set up to fail when you get to these places. And so um, this was for those students, you know, and this is called We Were Born Moving. It's a story about the migration of people like, uh, my daddy was one of the few people I know, I don't know, you, you came from a family of drummers. My, my daddy didn't work for the, um, for the big three, right? He didn't make cars. Um, but lots of people did. They came from the South to build these cars. And so when I was asked by Ted and Ford Motor Company to write a piece about movement, about the future of mobility, um, um, this is what came out. And um, yeah, I think it's a self-explanatory, but it's a, it's a celebratory piece. I'm very proud of the city I'm from, and I'm very concerned about what's happening to it. I'm very concerned. And you know, people say gentrification all the time, but you know, okay. You say it so much, and people don't even hear it anymore. They're like, oh, they're just complaining. But it's a real thing, you know, because I came from a blue collar working family on the west side of Detroit, um, with my, you know, four, you know, at the last four of my father's children in a house, and people just trying to like, you know, take their kids to good schools and have parks and the typical things you want when you're a parent. 
And I'm watching where I live, right in Corktown, I live in the middle of gentrification and colonization. Like, we get our streets paved so much. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, white people need, like, their streets paved, like, all the fucking time, apparently. And so we are always under construction with some new set of, I was like, how much? Paving do we need over here like a lots of paving we have you know now we're getting our bike lanes and you know I'm vegetarian right I lived in New York I ride a bike like I like the amenities of somewhere I can walk to get some Wi-Fi I'm there I'm with you but when Joy Road gets some Wi-Fi you know what I'm saying then I'll be a little more impressed with, with what's happening with the revitalization of Detroit and I have issues with the renaming of our streets and, you know, no longer Mexican village is no longer good enough. You want to give it, call it spring well bye. Could you please leave whoever the people are that are doing this madness? Um, but it's not gentrification, it's colonization. And, and there's a history of colonization of poor people's communities in this country. And gotta call it what it is, right? Because gentrification sounds like, you know, because every time I talk about gentrification, the people who are outside that argument just get called, they're just mad because they can't, you know, and I can afford to live down there, but I, I'm no longer in, it's no longer gives me, I'm not warm and fuzzy about it anymore. I'm looking at a house on the west side now because I wanna get the hell up out of it. Like I'm living in this bubble. It's a bubble, it's not, real Detroit is about working class people who are trying to send their families and their children to a school in the neighborhood they can walk to safely. That's Detroit I grew up on. I walked to Cody. I was in a safe neighborhood. Joy Road was safe. I'm a, I was a little girl, I could walk. And I played every varsity sport. I was at school late, so I walked home sometimes and my mom and dad couldn't get me. It was safe to walk. And there were stores on Joy Road and so, it bothers me that we have like, I don't care about new stuff coming. I drink coffee, whatever, I don't mind that. But if you're not balancing it with neighborhoods, if you're not about neighborhoods, then that 84% of the black people you act like don't exist anymore, really, you think another rebellion won't go down in this country? You think it won't happen in Detroit? Keep doing it, keep segregating yourselves. Segregation is not new, it's not sexy, it's not millennial, it's whack, you look crazy. What the fuck are all these white people doing in downtown Detroit? Where are the black people? Where are the black people? On Cass Corridor, I'm trying to figure out what the fuck they did with all the homeless. Where are my heroin addicts? Where are my homeless people? Where are my crackheads? Where are they? I wanna talk to them, I wanna share stories with them, I want to give them freaking pizza. Me and my son had a pizza from Jolly Pumpkin that had nasty pork on it by accident. So we're like, you know what, let's not throw it away, let's give it away. We drove up and down Cass Corridor that they call Midtown, trying to find a person to give some food to and couldn't find anybody. Just four years ago, there are people all over Petersburg, all over Cass, they living outside. Where are the people? What they do with them? I'm so serious. What do you do? Just, did you, they just take a shovel and push them on some alley? Did they put them, give them a bus ticket and send them to Cali? What they do with them? And this is what colonization does. People disappear. People disappear. And I ain't crazy. I'm telling you the truth. You can't find a homeless person to get something to eat. And the, all the beggars are white now. How that happen? Why are all the white people begging for money now? I'm tripped out. Like the, with gentrification comes the change of people who are panhandling. I'm like, for real? Like, you came from Seattle to beg for money? I'm trying to figure this shit out. It's very strange. But anyway, gentrification it sucks. If you're not saying anything about it and you're just drinking your latte and walking your dog, and you're a part of the problem too. So you, can, you have to raise hell about it. It's okay to have a coffee house in your neighborhood, but I integrate places all the time. I get all my black friends and say, hey, let's go to Great Lakes today. Let's go to this coffee house. Let's not let them think they could just be in Detroit and not see black people anymore. No, my white neighbors want to see black neighbor, black people. No, my white neighbor, Kyle's going to kill me. My white neighbor came up to me and was like, Jessica, I moved to Detroit and all I see is white people. Like, this is a tall white boy looking at me. I'm like, Kyle, do you know that you're white? He's like, but I didn't come here to be around me. I came here around to be about Detroit. And I was like, well, he is. He just got a house on the west side. So, yeah. But we need more on the west side. You know, so shout out to Vegan Soul on Grand River. You know, there's things that are happening in the neighborhoods and there, are black, there is black ownership in the neighborhoods, but they don't show that when, when uh, I remember some TV cameras came in years ago um, from NBC and they wanted to interview artists in the city in Invincible, y'all know Invincible? You should know she went to Invincible. They went to Pioneer High School. Um, so Invincible, they wanted to interview Invincible and Invincible was suggesting other people. So she gave, um, or they gave, She's a they, she, does, she uses the they pronoun. They gave my name and other people's names. And, um, 
and they said, the news people said, no, we don't want black artists. We don't want them. And they were like, really? You don't want black artists? No, we want to talk to white artists and see what white artists, what's it like to be a white artist in Detroit. <laughs> they had no interest in our voices. And so that's what happened. So anyway, this has nothing to do with my poem. So I'm gonna do my poem. <laughs> it's, it's called We Were Born Moving, and it's about the movement of our people in, in cars. We were one in five million migrating toward the north to find work, opportunity, Fathers, grandmothers, 140 trains arriving daily, a place known as an underground railroad stop across the water from another country. Our birth, a starting line, our journey constantly evolving. We were born moving, breaking rocks and racial barriers, leaving a pathway for the ones who came after us. My father came from Madison, Alabama. Some left Mississippi or Georgia, traveling somewhere, people with faith in their stride, pride in the tilt of a hat. Sometimes you must move with great intention, with force, with tears, fiercely into the unknown in order to survive. Dream chasers built Detroit, our great city of possibility. We the children of the Up South movement. We are the bold eight orters, those left ventricles geared Shifts. pulmonary arteries are pistons, transporting blood from the right ventricles. You must search for breath under the hood, inside our chest. Those arteries are connecting rods, carrying blood from the heart, the gas, that fuels our machine that drops off the most important little people in the world to elementary schools at 8 a.m. every morning. Imagine the body of a car as the body of a people, painted with thousands of extraordinary colors, mufflers as lungs, pushing in and breathing out the beauty of innovation, the complexity of history, the necessity of technology, and the simplicity of that road trip you simply keep dreaming about. Our bones in a semi-line of interchangeable parts. Our legs fought against segregation. Our arms reached for jobs at Ford Motor Company in 1919. A metropolis of ideas. The work, our minds, the workstations of the future. How we get there and who we bring along for the ride will be the marker of how history defines us. Everyone can't fit in the passenger seat. Some of our families are larger than a sport utility vehicle. Our aunties need a ride to work. We've adopted a few children who must stand in the cold to take the bus or walk to school in the cold winters of America. Humanity is not just oil, it is blood. It is the Amazon thrust of traveling stories, beating, speeding at 200 revolutions per minute. We, the economy of black gold survivors, a highway of stars shine bright as our rims. An expressway motor city of tomorrow could include making room for bike lanes and carpools and express train that can get citizens across our glove with ease. We are the hope and the heartbreak. A fast car with no brakes. We are the old school cutlass, the Cadillac, the focus. We're the prom date and the first kiss. We are our ancestors' wildest wish. We were born moving. Mobility is the ability of Aretha to reach that soul note and Smokey to rearrange our tears to know our city was built on love and Project Window Wonder Men and Supreme Women, the Holy Ghost of Alice Coltrane's heart, the power of Mary Hayden's hands flying down her base. Follow that sound on your favorite satellite station. Move closer to what really matters to you when you pull out your driveway in the morning. Press down on the pedal, press down on the pedal, Put the top down, expand your ideas past seven mile. Put the joy back in Joy Road, my Detroit block that included libraries and schools and walking distance. Our global city created the first highway. There's no reason we can't create a safer way for our families to drive on top of them. Who else to design the transportation of the future than the most resilient working people on the planet? I am a Detroit lion on Linwood, a rebellious tiger on Tyreman, a Stanley Cup carrying red wing on Rutherford, a Detroit piston constantly putting up new nets around forgotten white backboards and orange squares. Rebellious cities have never had it easy. Innovative highways aren't always paved in gold, but that thin strip of M8 we call the Davison is a conduit to every future highway in this nation, and so is assembly line steel and wheel of our rides. Detroiters have always kept this country moving. Our cars and streets built to the rhythm of a hand clap sound. We wipe away the tears of clowns. America would not be America if not for the Motown engine sound. The rewiring of humanity needs 
humans requires delicate components that connect people with luxury and dreams. The way immigrants and migrations and sweat created our automobile empires. Transportation should never be a reason our Detroit babies can't get to school or stay late to play on a sports team because the bus line isn't safe and mom works two jobs. If we can imagine a car that can fly past all our great expectations, then we can imagine a world where race is only about cars. Detroit is the starting line of the world's imagination. But it's not about how you start the race or the sacrifices you made to build your life in peace. It's how you found a way to push victoriously to the finish line. And while crossing over that white line, you consider the value of a speech about a mountaintop, an engine as a heart, mobility as a right, like breath, like water, like freedom, we only get there when every piece is moving together. Thank you. We the infatuated undertow. What time is it? Curve, what are, how am I doing? Do I need a right. what? Somehow, <laughs> find, somehow find, somehow find, somehow find, somehow okay. find, somehow find, somehow How y'all doing? I want to leave with you, don't play. So, yeah, are y'all good? I'm gonna do one last piece. Should we do freedom? I wanna do freedom. I wanna do freedom. Y'all good? We're good, all right. I want the energy up and then we can all leave together. And I have CDs and vinyl and books and stuff outside. So, um, thank you again. Please give some love to Marwan Amara. The Amara family out of Detroit, all over the world, all over the world, right here in Ann Arbor. And DJ Stacey Hot Wax Hell. After party at your, at my hotel? I don't know. Okay. So it's called Freedom. This is a track that Stacey produced, and we're going to be putting it out very soon, very soon, very soon. And it's just called Freedom. So it's just something fun. Um, if you guys want, can you stand up? You're young. Can you stand? Can we end standing? To get, can we stand up? Yeah, let's stand. Turn it up. Yeah, let's do that. Yes, Penny Sams, let's get li let's get live. <laughs> Touching the corner of a heart. Freedom is found in the lines of a palm, a hand replacing your soul, a believer, finding your tribe, telling your story, writing breath. Freedom is laughing despite the pain. Freedom is drinking rain. The wolf, the eagle, the panther, the wind, the student, the teacher, the hallucinators, the leaders, the followers, the dance floor, the new news, the truth tellers, the anointed, the dreamers, the hallucinators, the time stoppers. Freedom is believing in magic and first times and rebirths and revolution. Freedom is knowing your name, telling them how to say it. Freedom is the needle against the wax the spin of the record, the sum of all your fears, subtracted from your children's lives. Freedom is the beauty of tears. It's how we measure our life work, how we measure our life work, how we explore possibility, take risks, and live an unimaginable life. Freedom is never allowing them to tell you what you can't do. Freedom is never allowing them to tell you what you can't do. Freedom is releasing fear. Freedom is a kiss in a crowded airport, a long hug on a dark dance floor, holding his hand, holding her hand when everyone's watching. Freedom is loving out loud. Freedom is the light, the gold, waiting at the finish line. Freedom is the other side of the end of the night. Freedom is horseback riding through the ghetto, sleeping in on Monday morning, telling your boss you are no longer available. Telling your boss you are no longer available. We Refusing to wear the mask or sing on key or sacrifice yourself to serve. Freedom is never blocking the sun or your blessing, cleaning your dream catches on your Detroit West Side porch. I'm writing, I'm fighting, I'm writing, I'm fighting, I'm writing, I'm fighting. We are dying to live, we are dying to live. I forgive, start with yourself. You can't keep pushing silence out of your womb. Birth is noisy, messy, a spirit awakening, a crossing over. The way touching you makes my body numb for a few seconds before the blood rushes back in and the poem begins. And the dancers stretch and the mics get checked and the wine is poured 
and the trumpet coughs, yes, and lynching is theater. Freedom is knowing the people behind the times are before the time in the future. Freedom is wearing white all year long. Freedom is a collective sound. Freedom, freedom, freedom is the extension of the earth, the playground we are. We are freedom. University of Michigan, stay free. Stay free. Stay free in Ann Arbor. We outlive in our circumstances. We the peace. We the love. We the power. We the tomorrow. We the peace. We the love. We the power. We the poem. I love you. Thank you, Penny Stamps. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to my voice. I love you. I appreciate you. I'm here. If you need me, hit me up on any Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and I'll be here. I protested at Michigan State when I was there. I took over Wayne State University. Freedom. Whoever violated that beautiful, peaceful, peaceful rock that was created to represent all the Latino and beautiful people on this campus, Freedom. you know, call me next time y'all want to graffiti something and say something ugly Freedom. when people are trying to say something beautiful on this campus. Freedom. I'm coming with all my Detroit people. We got your back. You are not alone. Ann Arbor is not an island. We ride up 94. Get off on Bagley. Get off on Dexter. Get off on Learwood. You got Detroiters. We got your back. This is not, we're not alone. You're not alone. And we'll come to your aid. But I didn't like what they did to that beautiful rock that those wonderful students painted in solidarity of what you're supposed to represent at this level of thinking. This is what you're supposed to be about. You have to be the ones to change this country. If you don't change it, my son King is gonna do it for you, but make it easier on my baby, he's just 11. Make it right so when his time to vote it comes, you've already got this devil out of office and we got something new to re revamp our country and bring it back to what it was. I love you, I appreciate you. Make art that matters. Don't, don't follow money, fuck money. Make art, make love. I love you, <laughs> thank you. Jessica Caremore, give it up.